This video is the story of the world's most unusual salesman, Glenn W. Turner, and the commercial empires that he built in the late 1960s and early 70s, which also turned out to be some of the most audacious scams and pyramid schemes in recent American history. I can tell you in that one sentence what this video is about, but it doesn't begin to explain all the many facets of this story that lie under the surface. This is a story of greed, money, power, motivation, inspiration, self-determination, fraud, crime, and mental manipulation. During the heyday of his prominence in American society, which was considerable, Glenn W. Turner was hailed as a hero and a prophet by literally millions of people. He was also investigated and sued by the federal government and the attorneys general of numerous U.S. states. And he was denounced often by the same people who once lauded and worshipped him as a fraudster, a huckster, a con artist, and a crook. Collectively, he defrauded about 75,000 people out of nearly $50 million, a staggering sum for that era. But for a time, in 1971 and 72, Glenn Turner was on top of the world. Thanks to the phenomenal success of his businesses, Coscott Interplanetary Inc. and Dare to be Great! Exclamation point, Inc., Turner claimed to be worth something between $100 and $200 million. Floating through the air on his private jet, they were usually called Lear jets back then, he traveled four out of five days of the week to locations all over the U.S. and numerous foreign countries, giving speeches and selling his philosophy and himself. He was profiled in a lavish spread in Life magazine, which is where some of the pictures you've been looking at came from. He addressed Chamber of Commerce meetings, beauty pageants, and on one occasion, a convention of Model United Nations students at Harvard Law School. One time when he visited London, Landing at the airport on a rainy day, and a crowd of 300 people came out to see him and reportedly cried when he left. Turner's reach into the minds and hearts he touched was impressive. Many people said that he changed their lives for the better. Others insisted they'd gotten rich as a result of Turner. Others pretended to be rich. Turner was largely responsible for encouraging the ethos of fake it till you make it, which has since come to be characteristic of pyramid schemes. At one point, Glenn W. Turner was reportedly considering running for President of the United States in 1980. One source, Diana Monahan, his assistant and public relations officer, claimed that Turner once said one night aboard his Learjet, quote, you know, I think I am Jesus Christ, come again. These are some pretty extraordinary heights to reach for a common salesman. Turner had started his professional life hawking sewing machines, though his company, Coscott, retailed cosmetics and Dare to be Great sold motivational tapes. Or did they? The true nature of Turner's empire is a little more complicated than that. Glenn Turner, Coscott, and Dare to be Great were built on the uniquely American system of multi-level marketing, a type of pyramid scheme invented in the early 20th century and which has, particularly since the 1960s, metastasized like a cancer throughout the U.S. economy. The real profit in Turner's businesses came not from selling the products, but from selling distributorships, recruiting, essentially. That's the nature of multi-level marketing. Multi-level marketing companies, or MLMs, have long straddled a hazy line between legality and illegality, honesty and fraud, ethical and unethical. In the 1970s, Coscott and Dare to be Great clearly fell on the side of that line that was classified as fraud. Taken to trial twice in the 70s on various charges, Turner himself finally went to prison in 1987 for a third pyramid scheme called Challenge Inc. Coscott and Dare to be Great were undoubtedly on the fairly extreme end of the multi-level marketing spectrum, as was the previous MLM pyramid scam that gave birth to it holiday magic. Glenn W. Turner shouted louder, made more egregious promises of instant wealth, and recruited more brazenly than other MLMs. And as a consequence, he made more money than almost any other pyramid scam huckster up until that time in American history. But there's an argument to be made 
that the differences between Turner's operations and the MLMs that continue to exist today are differences only in degree and form, not in real substance. Indeed, Glenn W. Turner wrote a lot of the book that modern MLMs have been following for the past 50 years. In this strange and murky world of fraud and manipulation, Turner was a pioneer, a trailblazer, and in some ways, a patron saint. Those are the reasons why the incredible stories of Coscott Interplanetary and the man behind it are relevant today, and why you might spend the time with me to do a deep dive on them. Ground control to Major Tom, take your protein pill and put your helmet on, we're about to launch into the story of Coscott, the interplanetary scam. Hi, I'm Sean Munger, I'm a historian, and my niche here on YouTube is doing deep dive stories on various historical topics. Some of them, like this one, a little less prominent and visible than the high profile political stories that I've mostly covered in recent months. Before clicking on this video, you may never have heard of Coscott Interplanetary, Dare to be Great! Exclamation point, or Glenn W. Turner. But in the late 60s and early 70s, they were household names. The publicity that Turner and his enterprises generated was absolutely immense. And he himself was one of the most audacious self-promoters in American history up until that time. For years, there was a billboard paid for by him that welcomed visitors to Orlando, Florida, his home base, the home of the unstoppable Glenn W. Turner. The comparisons between Turner and 19th century showman and circus magnate P.T. Barnum were pretty frequent, and there's definitely something to them. In 1865, most Americans knew who P.T. Barnum was. In 1971, a country far more populous and complex than it had been a century before, a sizable share of Americans had heard of Glenn W. Turner. Today, as we near the end of the first quarter of the 21st century, unless you happen to study the history of multi-level marketing scams, almost no one has heard of him. In fact, when Turner died in early 2020, it took months for the national level press even to notice. I'm going to talk about Glenn Turner and his background more specifically in Chapter 3. It is a major part of this story. This video is sort of an unofficial sequel to the video I made in November 2022, detailing the history of the Amway Tools cult. But you don't need to have watched that one, or even know what the Amway Tools cult is, to understand this video. As I said in that video, while videos that intersect with the anti-MLM movement online are not my primary subject, I suspect this video will be of significant interest to people in that space, especially those who are interested in the history of multi-level marketing. To that end, as sort of a companion piece to this video, I appeared recently on Roberta Blevins' podcast, Life After MLM, to talk about Coscott Interplanetary and Glenn W. Turner. That episode is coming out in March. My sources for this video are listed at the end and in the video description as well. The video is broken up into chapters, so you can easily see what's coming up. In telling the incredible story of Coscott and Turner, I think we have to start with the foundation of Coscott Interplanetary itself, and also with the historical context surrounding it, which is extremely important to understanding where all of this came from and what it means in broader American history. We're going to be looking at the history of these infamous scams. However, scams of all kinds are still present today, as we should all be aware. Look at this story I found on Ground News about infamous college admissions scammer Rick Singer, who wound up going to prison. If you've been following my channel, you're familiar with the Ground News website and app that organizes the world's news in one place from across the political spectrum. They've been amazing in supporting my channel, and I really believe in what they're doing. Let me show you how it works. On the website, we can see this story about the college admissions scammer has been covered by over 140 articles, with the majority leaning center. 
Ground News shows you each story's political leaning, how factual their reporting practices are, who owns the publication, and where in the world it is or isn't being covered. Looking closer at this story, you may notice that only 13% of the sources covering it are on the right. This is what Ground News classifies as a blind spot. Very few sources on one side of the political spectrum are even interested in it. Notice the way left-leaning sources cover it. A couple of articles here describe the whole college admissions system as secretive, but that characterization is absent from sources on the right side of the spectrum, which seem to lean toward emphasizing the perpetrator of the crime as an individual. You would never notice this unless you toggle between the different kinds of sources covering the story. Ground News is also easy to personalize. Archaeology is one of the topics that I follow on Ground News, and in a couple of clicks I found this story about the underwater archaeology of the sunken ships of the Franklin Expedition, the famous British expedition to the Arctic that was lost in the 1840s. Ground News not only helps you stay informed, but you can find a lot of fun and interesting stuff on it. Ground News is a great tool to think critically about the information we consume and cut through the chaff and disinformation that's constantly clogging up our media environment. So, if you go to ground.news munger right now, you can subscribe through my link for 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to stay informed. And by subscribing to them, you're supporting my channel in the meantime. Now, back to the historical story. On August 22, 1967, the Beatles' single All You Need Is Love was at the top of the American record charts. The films that were playing in theaters that week included To Sir With Love, starring Sidney Poitier, and the groundbreaking Bonnie and Clyde, starring Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty. In Hong Kong, Mao's Red Guards stormed a British diplomatic compound, part of the ongoing Cultural Revolution. And several battles were going on in Vietnam. 1967 was nearing the peak of the United States' direct military involvement in that country. On that day, August 22, 1967, Glenn W. Turner, a salesman originally from Marion, South Carolina, filed papers in Florida to form a corporation, Coscott Interplanetary Inc., whose official line of business was to be cosmetics. Coscott began in a one-room office in Orlando, Florida with four employees, and its initial capital was $5,000, which Turner had borrowed from his uncle. All of the employees were Turner's friends or his former co-workers in another venture, Holiday Magic, which I'll discuss later in this chapter. To understand what Coscott was, where it was, and even what its name meant, you have to know something about what was going on in Florida in the late 60s. Orlando and Florida in particular had boomed in popularity and population in the 1920s when investing in Florida real estate was something of a bubble. After that bubble popped with the Great Depression, Orlando maintained some of its importance through the military and defense industry in the World War II and early Cold War eras. But two things boosted Orlando in the 1960s, space and Disney, in that order. Both are important to the Coscott story. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy committed the United States to land on the moon by the end of the decade. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The launch pad literally for that effort, Cape Canaveral, was renamed Cape Kennedy in his honor. Orlando, Florida was the nearest major urban center to the space program hub, less than 50 miles away. In the early 1960s, Orlando residents could look to the skies to see rocket ships, piloted by Alan Shepard and John Glenn, blazing trails into the bold new future. Space and the space age was a pop culture craze as much as a technological achievement and a temporary economic boom. By 1967, the moon program was still on, though it hit a snag after the tragic Apollo 1 fire. But before the death of Walt Disney in late 1966, 
No, he wasn't cryogenically frozen, as popular myth would have it. The cartoon and theme park mogul had dreamed of building a technologically advanced model community of the future on the premises of the theme park, Walt Disney World, that he and his companies had begun developing in the early 60s, and which was centered in the Orlando area around Bay Lake. Disney named his proposed model community EPCOT, an acronym meaning Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. Disney's version of the future, which Epcot was intended to bring to literal life, was classic mid-20th century futurism, based on the promise of ever-expanding technology and with an artistic and architectural aesthetic that was instantly recognizable. From the geodesic globe design pioneered by Buckminster Fuller, to the futuristic-looking architecture that had been most recently on display at the New York World's Fair of 1964, which heavily influenced Disney and those who followed his vision after his death. All of this meshed perfectly with the space program and its cultural trappings that were all the rage in Central Florida in the mid-60s. Glenn Turner was captivated by this sort of thing. As a businessman, he believed that Disney's proposed Epcot Center, whose designs and promises were all over the news in Florida at that time, was the boomtown of the next frontier. Turner wanted to associate himself and his new company, which as you recall was supposed to be selling cosmetics, with the big boomtown of tomorrow. He and his early executives named their company Coscott as a direct takeoff on the word Epcot. They also added the word interplanetary, which seems bizarre for a cosmetics company, but they added it to invoke the space stuff and to suggest that the company was so cutting edge that it was looking forward to the bold future just around the corner when humanity would supposedly be an interplanetary species. Because, of course, the first settlers on Mars, or their wives, astronauts in the 1960s, at least Americans, had to be men, they would need makeup, just like they did on Earth. Turner's mania for the space age, and for Epcot in particular, was overzealous from the very beginning. Some of Coscott Interplanetary's first sales literature, and it's telling that its sales pitch was the very first thing it ever developed, anyway, some of it included this sentence, quote, the reason we are so excited about Disney's great venture is because all the millions that are spent making Epcot famous will publicize Coscott as well, for we plan to have our interplanetary headquarters located in Epcot, end quote. There were two problems with this. First, it would end up being a long, long time before Epcot was a physical reality. Disney, as you recall, was dead. Not frozen, but still dead, and the Disney Corporation changed course after his death. The twists and turns of how Epcot actually got built don't concern us here, but suffice it to say, it didn't open until 1982, ironically, long after Coscott Interplanetary was mostly history. The second problem was that Turner and Coscott had absolutely no official relationship with Disney, whose legal department cried foul at the suggestion that the new cosmetics company was somehow affiliated with them. In October 1967, less than two months after the foundation of the company, Coscott Interplanetary was forced to issue a statement clarifying that they did not have any official connection to Disney, though even in their retraction they said, quote, it is true that Coscott is planning to have its interplanetary headquarters in Epcot. I mention this because it's a very telling indicator of how aggressive and zealous Turner and Coscott were, and how far they were willing to stretch the truth from right out of the starting gate. So at the beginning, these heady days in the summer and fall of 1967, there was a company, Coscott, a vision, Disney's bold world of tomorrow, and a personality, Glenn W. Turner. But what was Coscott Interplanetary actually selling? In August 1967, they had exactly zero product. Even if you happened to know one of Coscott's four employees personally, you could not buy a jar of cold cream or a tube of lipstick from them at any price. Coscott branded cosmetics at first did not exist at all. What Coscott was really selling from its first day in business was distributorships, and that was all. 
It was a recruiting chain. In fact, that was the whole reason for Coscott's existence. I'll return to that concept in just a minute. To solve the problem of a cosmetics company that didn't have any cosmetics to sell, Turner wooed an experienced cosmetics executive, a woman named Jerry Jacobus, to join the new company. Jacobus, who came to be known as Lady Coscott, knew her way around the cosmetics industry, and she had significant connections with cosmetics manufacturers, who were basically for hire. The manufacturers would put the name of any company on their stuff, so long as the client paid for the privilege of doing so. Jacobus' idea was to base all, or at least most, of Coscott's products around the idea that they contained mink oil. That wasn't a bad idea. Mink oil was a good ingredient for cosmetics due to its chemical similarities with human sebum, and in any event, it sounds luxurious and exotic. The problem was that there weren't that many mink oil suppliers in the United States. And while Coscott and Jerry Jacobus tried to secure as much supply as possible, it reached the market only very slowly and in a thin trickle. The shortage of mink oil meant that once Coscott actually had products to sell, which it didn't until early 1968, there weren't a lot of, a lot of them available at one time. Throughout its existence, Coscott had severe problems with product supply. So, for that reason, as well as the basic reality of how and why the company was founded, Coscott made most of its money from the sale of distributorships, that is, the right to recruit others into Coscott Interplanetary. It worked like this. For $10, a person, most likely a woman, could become a beauty advisor. The beauty advisors would be the retail salespeople. Think of the classic Avon ladies and they would be the foot soldiers of Turner's empire. At first, the beauty advisor level was inconsequential because Coscott had no cosmetics to sell. At the next level of the pyramid, at $125, you could become a coordinator, essentially a commander of beauty advisors. This level was also meaningless at first because of lack of product. Then the serious money started. A potential Coscott distributor could buy in at the supervisor level, which had a price tag of $2,000. A supervisor's job? Recruiting. Purely recruiting for the, for the lower levels and also other supervisors. And finally, at $4,500, the level marketed by Coscott as the most desirable was distributor. Potentially, a distributor could make over $2,000 on every other distributor that he or she, usually he, brought into the company. This is your absolutely classic pyramid scheme. And it was nothing but a pyramid scheme. Because at first in 1967 and part of 68, Coscott, as you know, had no retail products at all. Its sole stock in trade was distributorships. All the money that Coscott made in 1967 and 68 came from the initiation fees charged to new distributors. Glenn W. Turner designed Coscott this way from the beginning. We'll get into Turner's background in the next chapter, but it's important to note for now that the venture he was in just before starting Coscott was another MLM and notorious pyramid scheme called Holiday Magic. That company, whose supposed retail product was also cosmetics, was the brainchild of notorious con man William Penn Patrick, who founded it in 1964 after buying a load of surplus makeup out of a California garage from a failing venture called Zoline. Patrick, who made an appearance in my Amway Tools Cult video, was politically on the far right wing, associated with the extremist political cult known as the John Birch Society. After my Amway Tools Cult video came out, someone challenged me to produce a source proving that Patrick was a member of the John Birch Society. I did, a link to that source is in the description. Anyway, Patrick, who also got heavily into the motivation business, which I'll also talk about in the next chapter, he was facing problems from state and federal regulators who had noticed that Holiday Magic was making the vast majority of its money not from the sale of cosmetics, but from the sale of distributorships. In other words, they noticed that it was a pyramid scheme to try to provide some sort of minimal defense against regulators. In 1967, Holiday Magic instituted a change within its internal rules 
that provided certain retail sales quotas had to be met before a distributor within Holiday Magic could move up to a higher level of the pyramid. Glenn Turner, then a highly successful Holiday Magic distributor, couldn't meet these quotas, and he thought that concentrating on retail sales was a waste of time. So he quit Holiday Magic and started Coscott, which of course would not have a retail sales quota, at least not at first. This is an important fact because it's sort of the original sin baked into Coscott Interplanetary and eventually dare to be great exclamation point. Turner started them because he balked at the idea of having to sell retail in order to justify making money selling distributorships. In other words, Turner quit Holiday Magic, one of the most brazen pyramid schemes of its era, because it wasn't a pure enough pyramid scheme to suit him. That Coscott was a more pyramid-y copy of Holiday Magic, and that this was the specific reason Turner started it, is borne out by the later testimony of one of Turner's first recruits. In the spring of 1967, a man called Terrell Jones, I couldn't find a picture of him for this video, so I made a cartoon. Anyway, Jones was working on his PhD in mathematics at the University of South Carolina when he met Glenn Turner, who hustled him to join Holiday Magic. Jones first invested $135, then got excited by the money-making potential in Holiday Magic, he quit USC in the middle of final exams and went all in with a $2,500 investment. Terrell Jones quickly became Turner's right-hand man. Turner called him the professor due to his academic background. But only two months later, Turner told the professor that he was dumping Holiday Magic and starting Coscott. The reason, according to Terrell, quote, Holiday Magic had changed their policy and that change prohibited the distributor from making fast money. He wanted me to be an instructor and offered me $3,000 a month. It was just too tempting to pass up, so I called Turner and accepted." End quote. As one of the first employees of Costco, Tyrell Jones wrote the marketing program for the new company. It was copied almost verbatim from Holiday Magic's guide, even duplicating typos and grammatical mistakes from the Holiday Magic document. The emphasis was on recruiting, where Coscott distributors would hustle potential participants at high-pressure meetings where they promised that prospects would make big money fast. In fact, Turner insisted at these meetings that the S in every word written on a blackboard be rendered as a dollar sign. Another early participant was a man from North Carolina named Ben Bunting, whom I also couldn't find a picture of. Bunting had started a small wholesale drug company, and in his spare time, he was a Sunday school teacher at his local church. In the fall of 1967, one of his students came to Bunting and said that he'd invested $2,000 in a company called Coscott, and he thought it was some sort of scam. The student wanted Bunting's help in getting his money back. Bunting met Turner, and not only did he come away not believing that Coscott was a scam, but he eventually joined up himself, having been convinced by a sales pitch given by Terrell Jones. Turner ultimately asked Bunting to come into Coscott as an executive, and he later became one of the most important men in the company. In May 1968, less than a year after the foundation of Coscott, the company held an open house to dedicate its new corporate headquarters in Winter Park, Florida, just outside of Orlando. The Orlando Evening Star newspaper did a lavish and enthusiastic write-up of this event, which was typical of the Orlando press's treatment of Turner and the company, at least in the early years. The article repeated boasts, which probably came from Turner himself, about how Coscott achieved $67,000 of sales in its first month of operation, and had by May gone over a million. The article, however, erroneously stated that the source of these sales were from retail cosmetics. In reality, by the spring of 1968, Coscott branded cosmetics for retail sales had only just become available, and only then in a thin trickle. The true source of Coscott's revenue came from the sale of distributorships, pyramiding. In this article, Turner claimed that Coscott would ultimately make him a billionaire, and he added, quote, 
I will make at least 30 people a million dollars each along the way. I have been clearing the road to success for hundreds and even thousands of people. End quote. It's clear that Glenn W. Turner was extraordinarily charismatic and had marvelous powers of persuasion. But who was he? Where did he come from? That's the subject of the next chapter. The life story of Glenn W. Turner is not only extremely relevant to the history of his scams, it was in many ways the chief selling point of them. Due to this, and especially as a result of his primary identity being a salesman who came to prominence in the 1960s, the true facts of his life were and are heavily revised, rewritten, and distorted to fit the narratives he sold to his distributors, investors, and the public. We encountered this same problem in the Amway Tools Cult story when trying to get to the facts about the life of the Tools Cult's founder, Dexter Yeager. American salesmen at mid-century loved to twist and spin the stories of their own lives to support their narratives of achievement, usually some variations of a rags-to-riches fable. As a result, the stories that are publicly known about these kinds of people are less history and more hagiography, like the biographies of saints written and repeated in medieval Christianity. What we do know about Glenn Wesley Turner and what I was able to verify, not from hagiography, but from historical records, is that he was born in 1934 in Columbia, South Carolina, but his family called nearby Marion home for most of their lives. 1934 was the height of the Great Depression, and the South was one of the places where it was at its most depressing, with unemployment, bank failures, and foreclosures running high. Turner was fond of repeating that he was the son of a sharecropper, and that does appear to be true. But whether the Turner family was destitute in the sense of dealing with constant food insecurity or that they couldn't even buy clothes for their five kids, as Turner often stated or implied, that's far from clear. Almost the very first thing that everyone who met Glenn Turner learned about him was that he was born with what used to be called a hair lip, what is today called a cleft lip, closely related to a condition called cleft palate, a not uncommon birth defect. As a child and teenager, Turner had more than one operation to repair this, but it's a condition that can rarely be completely reversed, and Turner had a speech impediment for the rest of his life. In his motivational speeches and Coscott sales literature, Turner did his best to turn this condition into an asset, often stressing how he overcame it to be successful. There are hours, days, weeks worth of recorded Glenn Turner motivational speeches still available today. I'll play a short clip for you of his actual voice. Because Glenn Turner made it from a charity ward with a hair lip, an eighth grade dropout, I made it because I was too dumb to figure out how it wouldn't work. I didn't have any intelligent friends that discouraged me. I believed in the philosophy of Abraham Lincoln, of George Washington, I believe in the philosophy of Henry Ford, of Henry Kaiser, of the Rockefellers. I believe in the philosophy of the men who went out and did it in spite of the ones that tried to stop them as they did it. You see, the little world will try to stop you when you dare to be great. And sometimes they mean well. Sometimes they love you. They're concerned. They're, they're trying to protect you. But they really don't know any better. They simply don't even have the fact. How do you expect to convince a man in 30 minutes to believe in there to be great, to believe in himself, when it took him all his life to foul up his mind the way it is and not believe he can do anything. How do you expect a man to believe instantly when he's been taught instant disbelief? While obviously an obstacle while growing up in the mid-century South, Turner's speech affectation was indeed a considerable asset throughout his professional life, not just for its value in the overcoming adversity narrative, but because his speech was quite distinctive and anyone who heard him instinctively paid close attention to his every word so as to track on what he was saying. The hagiographies of Turner and his own representations also stressed 
his incomplete education, though the sources rarely agree on precisely when he dropped out of school, fifth grade, eighth grade, or something else. This is a picture of Glenn W. Turner as he appeared at Marion High School in 1951, in the ninth grade. His absence from subsequent yearbooks indicates that he dropped out probably in the ninth grade. Marion High was the better of the two high schools in Marion, South Carolina, socially speaking. All schools in South Carolina were rigidly segregated until the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, and then even considerably uh, farther afterward. After dropping out of school, Turner served briefly in the U.S. Air Force. This was at the height of the Korean conflict, but he never went to Korea. In fact, his time in the service was cut short when doctors discovered that he had a perforated eardrum, a condition that may have been, may have been related to his birth defect. After returning home, Turner attended a special school for adult education called the Opportunity School in Columbia. He also briefly attended junior college, a fact that he usually left out of his own description of his background as lacking any formal education. But by 1958, after an aborted attempt to become a hotel manager in Miami Beach, Turner had gotten a job in Greenville, South Carolina, as a salesman for a sewing machine company. He didn't know it yet, but he had found his calling. At mid-century in America, being a salesman was not just a profession. It was rapidly becoming an entire culture. Now, this really can't be overstated. The explosion of jobs that paid on commission in the years after World War II, as opposed to salaried or wage work, which had been traditional before, this offered an economic alternative to lower and middle class Americans. It was attractive to people like Glenn Turner, who saw validation in a profession where earnings were tied directly to one's own efforts. How many sewing machines, Bibles, steak knives, or sets of encyclopedias that one could sell? In that sense, sales was a profession divinely linked to the idea of the American dream, the frontier spirit, if you will. Combined with the very real economic pressures, if you don't sell, your family doesn't eat, sales was at the time a job, an art form, and a higher calling. Sales culture, particularly in the 1960s, was never seen more clearly than in the famous 1969 documentary, Salesman, by the Maisles brothers and Charlotte Zwerin, which followed a group of Bible salesmen peddling the good book for $49.99 in various New England neighborhoods. Glenn Turner excelled at sales, and he thrived in sales culture. He was an excellent sewing machine salesman, earning almost $40,000 a year in the early 60s, the equivalent of over 400000 in today's dollars. That's a lot of sewing machines. He suffered a personal tragedy. His wife, Phyllis Sparks Turner, died of Hodgkin's disease in 1960, leaving him a widower with a young son. He married again in 1962. He continued to do well. He had a nice house in Marion and apparently loved driving Cadillacs. Exactly how Turner got hooked up with William Penn Patrick's holiday magic scheme is a little unclear. This is in part because of the mythology Turner generated about his own life and background to bolster his rags-to-riches narrative, such as a 1969 book tellingly titled Con Man or Saint by a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist whom Turner hired as his publicist and who reduced Turner's life story to a series of nauseatingly simple-minded, repetitive parables meant to highlight how successful a salesman Glenn W. Turner was supposed to be. Nevertheless, it seems that Turner first encountered holiday magic in 1966, at the same time as he discovered Napoleon Hill's classic 1938 book, Think and Grow Rich, one of the original business motivational books. Patrick was not just running a pyramid scheme that pretended to sell cosmetics. He was also in the motivation business, where there was even more money. Patrick recorded and sold records of himself giving motivational talks, and events for holiday magic distributors were heavily infused with motivational messages. This was a fad in the mid-1960s. The fad came out of the success of a record produced in 1956 called The Strangest Secret, which had been cut by early motivational speaker Earl Nightingale, who himself had been inspired into the motivation business by reading, guess what? Think and Grow Rich. 
At exactly the time as Turner was getting into holiday magic and motivation, another salesman, Dexter Yeager, was following much the same arc within Amway. This is a common thread between this story and the story of the Amway tools business. Sometime in this period, probably 1966, Turner went to Nashville, Tennessee to hear William Penn Patrick speak at a holiday magic rally. Instantly, he was captivated, and William Penn Patrick was suddenly Glenn Turner's hero. He began playing motivational records by Patrick every night at home, constantly reinforcing the messages. So charged up by the holiday magic business, Turner quickly abandoned his sewing machine sales operation, selling his share of it to a partner for one dollar. Turner hit the bricks in North and South Carolina, driving his Cadillac around to hustle potential distributors. Evidence shows that he was not very interested in cosmetics for their own sake. A colleague with whom Turner worked during this time was quoted as saying, I was just like Glenn. I was interested in making money and didn't care much about cosmetics, end quote. Turner could not have been with Holiday Magic more than 18 months or so. As we saw in the last chapter, a change in Holiday Magic's plan designed to provide deniability against courts and regulators who were concerned with Holiday Magic's lack of interest in selling cosmetics as opposed to selling distributorships. Anyway, this caused Turner to jump ship and form Coscott as an even purer and more unadulterated pyramid scheme. The cosmetics were a front. The real money was in getting a slice of every new recruit's initiation fee. Coscott was not exactly a Ponzi scheme, but similar enough to it to be playing in the same ballpark, so to speak. The other thread here, motivation, and its potential as a standalone product, is worth spending some time on. Now, this section is probably going to be controversial, because the foundational texts and the, of the self-help and motivation industry and their purveyors, like Napoleon Hill, still have a lot of fans out there today. Napoleon Hill, who's relevant to our story because of the influence of his book, Think and Grow Rich, on both William Penn Patrick and Glenn W. Turner, was a notorious grifter and con man of the early 20th century. He fled Alabama after absconding with the proceeds of a fraudulent lumber company, then later established a fake college that taught people how to build cars. This was in 1912. But it was actually a front for a pyramid scheme that in many ways resembled later multi-level marketing scams. Hill falsely claimed to have been an advisor to President Woodrow Wilson and later to Franklin Roosevelt. The basis of his business motivation and self-help material was also fraudulent. Hill claimed to have interviewed Andrew Carnegie, then the richest man in America, and gotten all sorts of nuggets of wisdom from him. In reality, there's no evidence that Hill ever met Andrew Carnegie, and Think and Grow Rich, written in 1937, ironically when Hill himself was broke, was a runaway success the following year, as Americans were desperate for any glimmer of economic hope in the depths of the Depression. The source for this, a deep dive on the life of Napoleon Hill, which has been, like Glenn W. Turner's life story, significantly distorted by his supporters. Anyway, that's linked in the description. The next link in the chain leading to Glenn W. Turner is a man called Norman Vincent Peale, a conservative evangelical pastor who began writing self-help books and got heavily into the self-help business about the same time that Hill was enjoying success with Think and Grow Rich. Peel, in whose congregation was at one point a young boy named Donald Trump, hit it really big in 1952 with his book, The Power of Positive Thinking. This book refined the language of self-help and motivation that would later be used by salesmen like Dexter Yeager and Glenn Turner. Notably, Peel's book is one of the sources most responsible for popularizing an often attributed but fake quote from early 20th century psychologist William James. The quote is, The greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. End quote. There is no evidence that William James said this, but that has not stopped the motivation industry from mining this quote for all it's worth. It was, for example, 
One of the favorite sayings of businessman Mac Anderson, who founded the Successories Company, you know, the one responsible for all those motivational posters you saw on the walls of corporate offices in the 1990s and early 2000s. By the 1950s, when Peel was at the height of his influence and sales culture was crystallizing into its modern form, the positive thinking movement and sales culture had definitely melded together. I already mentioned Earl Nightingale and his 1956 record, The Strangest Secret, the first true business motivation audio program. It was probably inevitable that positive thinking and business motivation would become embedded within the MLM pyramid scheme universe that was already developing by the early 1950s, but which hit its true stride in the succeeding decade. Q. William Penn Patrick of Holiday Magic and Dexter Yeager of Amway. Glenn W. Turner was merely the next disciple to come out of the sales motivation pipeline. Indeed, by the late 1960s, business motivation materials had emerged as a distinct product line within the MLM universe. In 1967, William Penn Patrick, who was still scamming with Holiday Magic, founded another company, Leadership Dynamics, and he also participated in a similar company called Mind Dynamics. They sold self-improvement through the technique of what became called large group awareness training which came in for significant criticism in the 70s for its cultish aspects. Now, my point in detailing the evolution of business motivation as a for-profit industry and its relationship to pyramid schemes is to demonstrate how natural it was, indeed how inevitable it was, that Glenn Turner, ostensibly in the cosmetics business, would eventually wind up in the motivation and self-help business. How he made that jump and how Coscott Interplanetary segued into its bizarre alter ego, dare to be great exclamation point, is the subject of the next chapter. Coscott Interplanetary was a scam. In the next chapter after this one, I'll get into some of the individual stories of people who were scammed. But understand that as a pyramid scheme, Coscott made the vast majority of its money by selling distributorships and collecting initiation fees from recruits, not from selling cosmetics. As I noted in the last chapter, Glenn Turner designed Coscott this way, specifically to imitate in even purer form the previous pyramid scheme he had been associated with, Holiday Magic. This was the problem. By the time Coscott got up and running, Holiday Magic already had a bad reputation in the general public as a pyramid scheme, and legal offices, especially on the state level, were flooded with complaints about it. In 1968, a man called Robert Burren Morgan defeated North Carolina's longtime attorney general, Wade Bruton, in the Democratic primary and was elected attorney general. One of Morgan's top campaign supporters was a man named Gene Benoit, who Morgan rewarded with the office of Deputy Attorney General. Benoit had formerly worked for the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, which had also been inundated with complaints about holiday magic. Ironically, Benoit's brother also tried to hustle him to buy a holiday magic distributorship. So by the time Morgan and Benoit took office as Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General of the state of North Carolina, respectively, they were essentially lying in wait for Holiday Magic to pop up in their state so that they could investigate and potentially prosecute them. As it turned out, Holiday Magic didn't have much of a presence in the state of North Carolina, but Jean Benoit kept hearing about another MLM outfit that was running wild throughout the state. By early 1969, there were Coscott people fanning out through North Carolina. They recruited 700 new distributors there in only two months. And their playbook was the same as Holiday Magic, but even more pyramid-y. Shortly after he took office, Benoit found out that another department of the North Carolina state government was already investigating Coscott, the Securities Division. An investigator there was studying whether or not Coscott distributorships qualified as a security. This question becomes especially important later on in another context, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. 
A security is a type of financial investment. The classical example of a security, and the easiest to understand, is a share of stock in a company. Let's say you own one share of Apple, Inc. You own a tiny piece of Apple, and the company will pay you a dividend every year based on how well Apple, Inc. does that year. Your share also has a dollar value on the open market. On the day that I wrote the script for this chapter, one share of Apple was worth $187.26. What makes this a security is that whatever gain you realize from your share is dependent on how well Apple does. It's not dependent on what you do, but on the efforts of others, such as the manufacturers and salespeople out there selling Apple products. If you're just an investor and the return you get depends entirely or mostly on the efforts of others, which is different than, say, if you open your own business like a hardware store, or if you earn money flashing your booty on OnlyFans, then your investment is classified as a security and is thus subject to the many laws, both federal and state, that regulate securities. A share of stock is the paradigm example, but it's not the only example of a security, far from it. If the definition of a security is the return you get depends on the efforts of others, not yourself, then a lot of different things could qualify as securities. So, suppose you buy a Costco distributorship. As the salesman who pitched you the gig probably told you, you make money by recruiting others and then taking a piece of the initiation fees of everyone that the person you recruited ends up recruiting themselves. That's the nature of a pyramid. Does that mean that your investment depends mostly on the efforts of others? Maybe. Maybe not. It's not really that clear cut. In February 1969, the state of North Carolina asked a court for a temporary injunction to prevent Costco from selling distributorships that were not registered under the state securities laws. A judge granted that injunction. Not long after that, Costco representatives, Ben Bunting was one of them, negotiated with the North Carolina Attorney General's office and voluntarily agreed to stop selling distributorships in that state. This victory against pyramid schemes made Jean Benoit something of a hero in the crowd that he ran in. During the spring of 1969, he attended a meeting of state attorneys general in Baltimore, during which he gave a speech bragging about the recent victory against Costco. What this did was to introduce attorneys general all across the U.S. to Costco and put them on notice that they might become a problem. There's some historical context here that's helpful in order to understand these developments. The late 60s was toward the beginning of what you might call the consumer movement. The great prosperity that swept America after World War II and the huge array of cheap, mass-produced goods available to ordinary people, from televisions to cars to Barbie dolls and Elvis records, all of that had given Americans a role many hadn't recognized before. They were consumers. In the 1960s, there was a growing awareness that, as consumers, people had rights against companies and business interests that produced shoddy or dangerous products, or who outright defrauded people. Ralph Nader was one of the OG consumer advocates. A lawyer and journalist, in 1965, Nader published an expose, Unsafe at Any Speed, that criticized American car manufacturers for not making cars safe enough. He famously singled out the Chevy Corvair as especially dangerous. In 1968, Nader recruited a group of law students to investigate the practices of the Federal Trade Commission to evaluate whether they were advocating hard enough for ordinary consumers. This group came to be known as Nader's Raiders, and their work was pretty influential. After Richard Nixon came to power in 1969, he overhauled the Federal Trade Commission and beefed up its consumer protection mission, which is exactly why the FTC figures so prominently in the later stages of our story when we get into the 70s. But Nader was not the first to do this. Lawyers were making big names for themselves and big money representing clients in products liability cases in this period. The most well-known of these celebrity lawyers was Melvin Belli, who in 1944 won a case before the California Supreme Court involving an exploding Coke bottle, which established the legal doctrine 
of strict liability for defective products. Belli became so famous in the 60s that he eventually did a guest shot on Star Trek. Seriously, he did. Anyway, back to Coscott. The Michigas in North Carolina, notwithstanding, Turner's Pyramid was doing very well in 1968 and 69. They were selling distributorships all over the place, with the notable exception of North Carolina, through a technique of high-pressure sales meetings called GO, or Golden Opportunity Meetings. These were group meetings where the salespeople, using a script developed by Turner and his top aides, revved the crowd into a frenzy over how successful they were going to be. GO meetings typically started with a statistic, unsourced and misleading, claiming that of 100 men who began their work lives at 25, by age 65, supposedly 36 of them were dead, 54 were broke, 5 were still working at age 65, 4 were, quote, financially secure, and only 1 was rich, whatever rich meant. We will show you tonight, the recruiters were instructed to say, how Coscott can make you a member of the successful 5%. They dressed up the recruiting and pyramid scheme nature of the business by calling it wholesaling and promised people could make up to $25,000 a month. Just for reference, $25,000 in 1969 is about $211,000 in today's money. Sometimes these golden opportunity meetings were held aboard airplanes. In its heyday, the company, Coscott, owned a number of Learjets and prospective distributors were invited to fly on them with the high-pressure sales pitch given during the flight. The prospects were literally a captive audience and the recruiters were relentless, high energy, and flamboyant. They would lead prospects in a chant of money before boarding the planes on these tours. Prospects were often asked to bring pre-written cashier's checks from their banks for $5,000 each. The salespeople were so confident that all of them would sign up during the flight. The mantra that was drummed into the salespeople's heads was, get the check, get the check. At one of the trials, there was testimony that salespeople were encouraged to drive prospects to the bank to take out second mortgages on their homes to finance buy-in to Costco or Dare to be Great, even if the people couldn't afford it. Salespeople themselves were encouraged to buy expensive cars, especially Cadillacs, and to wear jewelry to promote the illusion that they themselves were rich. This is the fake it till you make it tactic. The high pressure sales worked. One distributor who signed up later told an investigator, quote, when I got back home, I didn't sleep for five nights after this, neither did my wife. The guy got us so jacked up, I was ready to sell the Brooklyn Bridge to Eisenhower, end quote. Through all this, Glenn W. Turner was getting rich. He bought cars and airplanes literally on impulse. He dressed flashily and passed out $100 bills in crowds that gathered around him and his plane. He bankrolled a rock and roll festival that was supposed to happen in Puerto Rico. It never did. He bought a farm league football team, the Orlando Panthers, that ended up costing him a bunch of money. He was also a philanthropist. The adult education program that he'd attended back in South Carolina, Opportunity School, he gave them a million dollars for a scholarship fund. He encouraged Coscott distributors in Ohio to raise nearly 100000 to build a home for developmentally disabled children. Turner instituted hiring practices within Coscott that sought to employ people with disabilities. And in fact, Coscott at one time reportedly had more employees with disabilities than any other company in Florida. It was rumored that if you had a cleft lip or cleft palate, you could get hired, no questions asked. Given the way that motivation and self-help philosophy were becoming twinned to the sales culture of the 60s, it's probably inevitable that Turner decided to go into the motivation business. The idea began in spring 1969, the same season when North Carolina was trying to shut them down for being an unregistered security. Ben Bunting, who as you recall had been involved in the North Carolina operations, he suggested to Turner that they build a uniform motivation course for Costco distributors. Reportedly, Bunting broached the idea while they were riding in Glenn Turner's Rolls Royce through the center of Orlando. Turner loved the idea 
and he turned to a Coscott executive, Clyde Cobb, to make it happen. In fact, Turner spun off a brand new company for the motivation courses, and he made Cobb the CEO of that company. Originally, the company was supposed to be called Dare to be Big, but a distributor from Ohio, a woman who said she weighed 300 pounds, wrote to Coscott headquarters saying that she was already big, but she would like to be great. So Turner renamed the company Dare to be Great, and he added the exclamation point himself. The idea was that Dare to be Great exclamation point would offer, and by offer I mean sell, a whole course on personal motivation, which was to utilize a new technological gadget that was at that time transforming the motivation business, the cassette tape. LP records and reel-to-reel were too cumbersome, but cassette tapes on the rise in the late 60s were light, cheap, and easy to manufacture, and portable. Teaming up with a professional writer the company hired, Clyde Cobb wrote the script for the first of several motivation courses that the company would sell, called Adventure One, that's Roman numeral one. They wrote the class in two months. The main source they used? Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. Glenn Turner taped the course sometime in summer 1969, according to Cobb, while they eventually did get it all on tape, Turner wasn't very serious about it, constantly doing flubs, jokes, and outtakes. Dare to be Great and Adventure Roman Numeral I were introduced at a national meeting of Coscott distributors in the fall of 1969. The distributors went wild. The company took $42,000 worth of orders for Adventure Roman Numeral I that night alone. Clearly, it was going to be a success. Dare to be Great came along at precisely the right time. By 1969 and early 1970, state attorneys general, remember they heard about Coscott from Jean Benoit, anyway, they started moving against the company in several states, either claiming it was a pyramid scheme, which clearly it was, or else an unregistered security, which it could be, depending on how you interpreted the laws. Texas and Ohio banned the sale of Coscott interplanetary distributorships. More states were starting investigations. Several state courts granted injunctions and restraining orders against recruiting distributors. And for the first time, Coscott's bottom line began shrinking. In fact, it shrank fast. People at the company were whispering that it was soon going to close. Turner finally seemed to understand that the company was going to face a lot of legal battles. In the fall of 1969, Diana Monahan, who had recently become Turner's executive assistant, she suggested that he get a big-time lawyer in Coscott's operation to head off all of these problems. She suggested arguably the most high-profile lawyer in America at that time, even bigger than Melvin Belli, F. Lee Bailey. Turner and Bailey first met at a hastily arranged meeting at the airport in Oklahoma City. Bailey, a former naval aviator during the Korean War era, had come to prominence as the defense lawyer for a man called Sam Shepard, not the playwright and actor, but a man who was accused, falsely it turned out, of murdering his wife in Chicago in 1954. Shepard's case was the inspiration for the 1960s TV series The Fugitive, starring David Jansen, and eventually the 1993 movie with Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. Bailey had also defended Albert DeSalvo, the man accused of being the infamous Boston Strangler. He was probably the most famous lawyer in America at the end of the 1960s. The legend is that at their meeting, Bailey asked Glenn Turner how serious his company's legal problems were, and he reportedly replied, at the moment, it's me against the United States. Bailey is reported to have replied, well, I've always liked a fair fight. Bailey came aboard immediately. He started flying around the country, meeting with state attorneys general, trying to satisfy their investigations and head off further problems. Some minor tinkers were made to Coscott's marketing plan to mollify them. This staunched the financial bleeding for now. But what really bailed out Glenn W. Turner was the new motivation business, Dare to be Great. Adventure Roman numeral one, a course on self-understanding, which was basically just a series of motivational bromides, was followed by Adventure two, which was about relating to others. Adventure three, a course in salesmanship, 
Buying this level also gave a person the right to recruit others into the pyramid. And the highest level was Adventure 4, Glenn W. Turner's Personal Secrets for Success. These subject distinctions had very little substance. The course was pretty much the same wherever the needle dropped. If these adventures with Roman numerals behind them sound a lot like the levels on the so-called Scientology bridge, they should. L. Ron Hubbard was developing a very similar sort of hierarchy at exactly the same time. And of course, you had to pay more for each level. To get through all four of Dare to be Great's, quote, adventures would cost you $5,000, the equivalent of about $42,000 in today's money. The tapes, dozens of them, came in a specially made briefcase to haul them around. Dare to be Great was fiercely multi-level. A distributor would pay for the course themselves, then pocket $2,000 for every person they recruited who also bought all the way up to Roman numeral IV. As legal troubles mounted with Coscott, Turner began shifting his highest performing distributors, the kingpins, into selling Dare to be Great distributorships. The legal people, including F. Lee Bailey, recommended that Coscott satisfy the circling wolves by spending more effort on actually selling cosmetics. Turner didn't do that. The truth was, he was bored by the cosmetics business. Motivation and his philosophy, that was what he really wanted to sell. At its core, multi-level marketing is what's called an endless chain. It's all about recruiting. That's where the money is and where it was for Coscott. Retail products are window dressing to try to mask the central truth of what MLM is. All the legal battles over MLMs from the beginning have essentially been about how much window dressing is enough. Turner didn't care very much about the window dressing. By 1971, he'd made a fortune through his pyramid schemes. He was rich, floating around in a Learjet, being hailed like a rock star at the numerous motivational rallies he attended. But his pyramid schemes were built on the backs of real people who were not getting rich. Some of their stories are in the next chapter. <laughs> In 1972, a couple from the small town of McCook, Nebraska, Bob and Susan Erig, were coaxed by Bob's sister and her husband to go to Omaha across the state to look into a hot new business venture that the sister and husband had recently joined. The meeting for the opportunity was in the ballroom of the Hilton Hotel in Omaha. It was a go tour for Dare to be Great. The salesman preached the evangel of Glenn W. Turner, stressing that everyone there had all the smarts they needed to become rich. The buy-in price was $2,000. The Erigs asked Susan's father for a loan for the money, which he gave them. Dare to be great distributors were encouraged to drive flashy cars to impress potential prospects. The Erigs bought a used 1968 Cadillac, and Susan sewed for her husband an orange polyester suit. Hey, this was 1972, to go on sales meetings. The Erigs met Glenn W. Turner on a trip to Florida. They were impressed by him and particularly by his ostentatious mansion outside Orlando, which I'll talk about in the next chapter. But when they returned to Nebraska from fl the Florida trip, they read in the papers about the numerous court actions that were then going on against Turner and his businesses. They'd already spent thousands of dollars wooing potential prospects and getting a few in, but the company wasn't paying commission checks. When Bob Erig finally got someone on the phone from Dare to be Great, they told him that the company's accounts had been frozen by the courts. The Erigs lost their house and sold what few belongings they had. They limped into Omaha driving the used Cadillac and stayed in a cheap motel. With only $200 to their names, Dare to be Great had utterly cleaned them out. This kind of story was not atypical. In 1971, a 24-year-old Air Force airman in Ohio, a week away from leaving the military, found a flyer advertising Dare to be Great on the windshield of his car after he came out of a job fair. The flyer included an invitation to an adventure meeting, one of the types of sales pitches Dare to be Great was using at that time, sort of a go-to-er light. The ex-airman went to the meeting but was unimpressed with the salespeople and walked out. However, Dare to be Great salespeople, 
who now knew who he was, harassed him with phone calls and visits to his new place of employment until he agreed to sign up, which cost $5,000, most of his savings. Within two months, the ex-airman hadn't recruited a single person, but not for lack of trying. He'd estimated he'd spent $2,500 on ushering prospects to go tours and various other expenses, none of which were paid by Dare to be Great. The airman was one of the lucky ones. He had savings to buy in. Many prospects took out loans and were on the hook for those loans after they made no money. A letter received by Coscott Interplanetary's legal department, also from a service member turned distributor, explained how he'd been ripped off, his words, for $2,000 by a Coscott recruiter, and he owed that to the finance company. The man said, quote, to hell with riding around in Cadillacs, Mark IVs, and flashing $100 bills in people's faces. I would like to be refunded my $2,000 as quick as possible, end quote. A couple from Indiana got fleeced by Coscott for $5,000, hoping to make enough money to pay for medical treatments for their chronically ill children. They borrowed the $5,000 and made nothing. Coscott ignored their letter. Another man wrote, quote, once they had my certified check, there was much less secrecy and a lot more facts. What deception. These people were products of Glenn Turner, a man who was preaching the importance of the individual, helping others find their personal peace, and joining others in love, unity, and understanding. What corruption. What a false prophet. Then he will justify everything by being generous to charities. End quote. In 1970, according to a study done by the New York State Attorney General's Office, there were 1,604 active Coscott distributors in the state, of which only 79 made more than $5,000, meaning they got their initial investment back, not counting numerous miscellaneous expenses that Coscott did not reimburse. Only 10 distributors in the entire state had earned more than $20,000, as you recall, the Coscott recruiters said that it was routine for people to make fifty or even $100,000 a year in Coscott. In Pennsylvania, of 845 people who signed up as Dare to be Great distributors in the last few months of 1971 and first months of 72, only 72 broke even. 656 made no money at all. The richest Dare to be Great distributor in the entire state of Pennsylvania made only $19,700, again, far below what the recruiters said many people could and would earn. The reason is mathematical. Unless you're at or near the top of a pyramid scheme, it's almost impossible to make money. To make more money, the people you've recruited have to recruit more people, and soon, very quickly, in fact, the market is saturated. Take those roughly 1,500 Coscott distributors in New York State. The Attorney's General's Office figured out that for each of those people to earn $100,000 a year, they would have to collectively had to have recruited 150,000 people in one year. And if those people they recruited were going to make $100,000 a year, they will have had to have recruited 15 million people the next year. The population of New York State was about 18 million in 1970. That included children, the elderly, convicts, people in institutions, everybody. There were not enough human beings in America or the world for the income promises to possibly be true. How did Glenn Turner explain this? He said and said frequently that three out of four people who tried Coscott or Dare to be Great wouldn't succeed, but not because it was a pyramid or an endless chain. It was because the people preaching negative thinking, Martians he called them, would poison the minds of new distributors so badly that they would fail. And since, as Napoleon Hill counseled in Think and Grow Rich, success was entirely dependent on positive thinking, it just meant People didn't believe hard enough. This is a common refrain from defenders of pyramid schemes. Naysayers preaching negativity, what Amway Tools cult kingpin Dexter Yeager called stinking thinking, was always the cause of failure. With Glenn Turner, this was gospel. Another common defense, particularly used against regulators in lawsuits, was for Turner to blame the more grandiose promises of easy income and fabulous wealth on overzealous recruiters who weren't following the book. 
and who sometimes concealed the identity of what they were selling from potential prospects, which Amway distributors also did, euphemistically calling it the curiosity approach. But mostly, Turner employed a sour grapes sort of defense. People talked bad about his company, he said, because they couldn't make it and they wanted everyone else to fail too. Whatever the mechanism, the ultimate cause was a failure of positive thinking, according to him. When motivation itself becomes a product, as it was in Dare to be Great, the negative thinking of Martians becomes a sales incentive. Tell me, ex-airman from Ohio or gardener from Nebraska, are you frustrated that you're not making boatloads of money at Dare to be Great? Here, buy more tapes and listen to more inspirational speeches by Glenn W. Turner. That's the ticket. If Turner ever understood the impossibility of ordinary people making money in a pyramid scheme, or if he ever appreciated the predatory nature of his businesses, he never let on, at least not publicly. He was fond of claiming that he wanted to be remembered for making more millionaires than anyone in history. Incidentally, that's a talking point, a false one, that Amway has used since the 1960s. To Turner, the consumer advocates, the FTC and the state attorneys general hounding him were just negative thinkers, Martians, trying to tear him down because he was too successful. This sold well to the crowds who turned out at his rallies. There was a populist edge to Turner's sermons. He often reminded the crowds that only a small slice of Americans owned the vast majority of wealth in America, which is true. What was untrue was the implication or the statement that he would change that by making all those people in the audience into millionaires. If I'm a con man, he said, the American people have made me a con man by buying what I sell. That, at least, is something he said that is indisputably true. Nineteen seventy one was the peak of Glenn Turner's success and also the beginning of his downfall. In May of that year, he was profiled in Life magazine, not on the cover, as some press reports later claimed, but he did get an extensive spread, which was generally, though not entirely, positive. But things were changing at his companies. He now had a lot of them. Coscott Interplanetary and Dare to be Great! Exclamation point were the biggest ones, obviously, but there were a host of subsidiaries that Turner hoped would market everything from records to clothes to mouthwash. All were under the umbrella of Turner Enterprises, which Glenn Turner said would be the biggest corporation in the world by 1975. Success had gone to his head. In 1971, the cosmetics expert he'd hired, Jerry Jacobus, once known as Lady Coscott, not only quit the company, but sued Turner. She was the only other stockholder of Coscott Interplanetary, and her lawsuit claimed he had squandered company profits by buying expensive houses, his Rolls Royce, and his own fat salary. The lawsuit was settled out of court. Jacobus was quoted as saying, the man's ego had gotten out of control. Ben Bunting, one of the original executives from 1967, was also out during 71, as were Clyde Cobb, who had created the adventure courses, and Terrell Jones, and most of the other old guard. Turner's new right-hand man was Hobart Wilder, no photo available, who eventually became president of both Coscott Interplanetary and Dare to be Great. Wilder was so trusted that he eventually moved into Turner's home. There was plenty of room. Now, we have to talk about Glenn W. Turner's mansion, or castle, you might call it. Part of it still exists. Here it is, located on Bear Gully Lake in Winter Park, Florida, outside of Orlando. The place reportedly cost $3.5 million when Turner began building it in 1972. The original castle-like mansion, which burned down in the 80s, originally had turrets and towers, like Sleeping Beauty's Castle at Disneyland, which itself is modeled on a fantasy castle in Bavaria called Neuschwanstein. The most dominating feature of Turner's castle was a round boathouse with a giant center room and a fireplace. That's the part you can see today still on Google Earth. The other homeowners in the area weren't happy about their new neighbor, and especially the garish design of his pleasure palace. Turner threw a party for them to try to win them over to his side, but relations remained frosty. 
It was years before the castle was finished, and Turner did not live there for long. He had the bad luck to begin building it as his fortunes were starting to decline. The wolves were circling. With the FTC revitalized under Richard Nixon, which I mentioned earlier, the agency, which had been swamped with complaints about MLM pyramid schemes in the early 70s, seemed an increasing threat. Turner's legal fixer, F. Lee Bailey, saw a negotiation with the federal government, and especially the FTC, as the only way to forestall the numerous lawsuits by state attorneys general. So in 1971, Bailey went to Washington to try to negotiate with the FTC. After marathon negotiation sessions, they reached not one, but two potential deals, scaling back Coscott and Dare to be Great's misrepresentations and tweaking once again their sales manual. But the FTC changed their minds on both potential deals, leaving Bailey empty-handed. Turner saw this as a declaration of war. He was convinced the federal government meant to run him out of business. And, as we'll see, he wasn't wrong. After the second FTC deal cratered in early 1972, F. Lee Bailey left the Coscott operations. He was out, joining the rogues gallery of ex-executives, but it was far from over for him. An agreement with the FTC probably would have forestalled court actions by state attorneys general all over the country. But without that big overarching agreement, individual states kept on shutting down Coscott or Dare to be Great or both within their borders. California was the latest one to ban Coscott in its state, a huge market. Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware also tried with some, but not total success. The Iowa Supreme Court declared Coscott a pyramidal sales promotion scheme in 1971. This was so far the highest court to rule against them. But Turner was still alive in many states. During 1972, money was still coming in from the schemes. But soon, a new enemy was on the horizon, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. Remember back in Chapter 4, when I spent some time explaining that theory that Coscott Interplanetary might have been a security? In 1968, when Coscott voluntarily agreed to stop selling distributorships in North Carolina, the securities argument was a threat on the state level. But in the fall of 1971, the SEC, a federal agency, started looking into the question of whether Coscott counted as a security under federal securities laws. In early 1972, the SEC put an unobtrusive ad into a publication called The Franchise Journal. It read, quote, The SEC is asking the public for help in its investigation of multi-level or pyramid distribution schemes. The request comes after the SEC announced it was looking into the operations of companies such as Coscott Interplanetary, Holiday Magic, and Best Line Products to determine if their marketing practices constitute the selling of a security, end quote. If Coscott and Dare to be Great were dinosaurs, the SEC notice was the first glimmer in the sky of the asteroid that was coming to annihilate them. If they ruled on a national level that Coscott was a security, then it would have to be registered with the SEC, like any other stock or bond. Its salesmen would have to get accreditation as licensed securities broker-dealers. SEC rules and federal laws would prohibit exactly the kind of grandiose inflated sales pitches that typically convinced people to sign up to become distributors. At first, Turner wasn't that concerned about the SEC, even after the agency filed suit against Dare to be Great in May 1972. The SEC didn't have a mastermind legal strategy. They often filed suit just to test the waters. But the agency was very clever on this one. First, they chose to go after Dare to be Great alone, not Coscott, anticipating that Coscott could defend by pointing to a warehouse of cosmetics in Orlando and saying, see, look, we're not a pyramid scheme. There's the product right there. Dare to be Great had only tapes. Second, the SEC filed suit in Portland, Oregon, where a federal court had recently ruled in a private lawsuit that Dare to be Great was a security. To defend, Turner hired a lawyer recommended by F. Lee Bailey called Theodore Koskoff, that's Koskoff, not Coscott, one of the country's most respected trial lawyers, Koskoff had made a name for himself defending various members of the Black Panther Party. 
There was a colorful and eventful trial in Portland in the summer of 1972, featuring not only legal and securities experts who testified about whether Dare to be Great was a security, but former distributors who had been ripped off by Turner and who told stories about his bragging and excesses. In the late summer, the federal judge in Portland issued a decision. He declared that Dare to be Great was a security, that it had been sold in violation of federal securities laws, and that it would have to be closed down immediately. Turner's lawyers appealed the decision, but it was upheld. The Portland decision in the SEC suit killed Dare to be Great, exclamation point, stone cold dead, almost instantly. Turner immediately went into panic mode. He had not expected that the SEC would win, but the sweeping scope of the judge's decision had left no doubt that he was in serious trouble. Moreover, there were new threats emerging on the horizon. About the time the SEC was gearing up its lawsuit, a case was filed in western Pennsylvania against Coscott and Dare to be Great, a class action lawsuit. Then, emboldened by the Portland decision, the SEC decided that they were going to try to nail Coscott Interplanetary after all, using the Dare to be Great decision as a precedent. Koskoff and the lawyers tried a legal maneuver that had never been done before. Instead of fighting the class action lawsuit in the normal way, they admitted the existence of a class of plaintiffs who had potential claims against Coscott Interplanetary, but they tried to get them all consolidated into one case, then to work out a settlement that would apply everywhere across the whole country. That would halt all other litigation everywhere in the U.S. against Coscott. Incredibly, it worked. In late 1972, a federal judge in Pittsburgh issued an order that froze all other litigation pending the result of the Pittsburgh class action case. It was a victory for Turner and his lawyers, but only a temporary one. The problem for them was that a settlement would eventually have to be paid to the victims, those defrauded by Coscott and Dare to be Great. And the assets of Turner's companies, so immense on paper, proved pretty weak in reality. A year earlier, Turner boasted he was worth $100 million or even $200 million. In reality, by the end of 1972, he could barely scare up $3 million, but the settlement would need almost $50 million to satisfy about 75,000 victims. Turner would have to sell his castle, his Rolls Royces and Cadillacs, his Learjets, his flashy polyester suits, his rhinestone-encrusted American flag lapel pins, everything. The hits kept coming. The latest enemy to come after Glenn Turner was, like the SEC at first, seemingly inconsequential, the post office. Yes, the U.S. Postal Service. In late 1972, postal investigators were building a case that Glenn Turner and his top associates had used the U.S. mail to defraud investors. This was not a regulatory case like the SEC or FTC could have done, and it was not just against the companies, Coscott or the now dead Dare to be Great. It would also be against Glenn Turner personally, and probably others in his circle. If successful, this mail fraud case would put Glenn Turner behind bars. Just after the turn of the new year, 1973, Glenn Turner paid for a full-page ad in the Orlando Sentinel, his hometown newspaper that had been the vanguard of press reporting on him and his empire since it began nearly six years earlier. The ad featured a photo of Turner standing on the shores of the lake where his castle was located, looking like a mythological hero, if mythological heroes wore 1970s bell-bottoms, boots, a broad striped collar shirt, and a fairly obvious toupee. Surrounding the photos were the words, Lord God, give me the strength and courage in 1973 to continue the businessman's and individual's fight for free enterprise. Ultimately, that was how Turner was going to frame it. A good versus evil struggle of freedom and free enterprise, which Turner, of course, thought that he represented, versus the evil oppression of the state. On May 18, 1973, in a Washington, D.C. courtroom, basically the last moment before the Capitol's courtrooms were completely swamped by the Watergate affair, the Justice Department issued an indictment of 10 people on mail fraud charges. Glenn W. Turner was at the top of the list. Also indicted were Coscott CEO and former Dare to be Great CEO Hobart Wilder, Ben Bunting, Turner's former consigliere, 
Clyde Cobb, who had written the Dare to be Great Motivational Courses, Terrell Jones, called The Professor, and most notably, F. Lee Bailey himself. Altogether, there were 27 counts of mail fraud and one count of conspiracy to commit mail fraud. The acts alleged in the indictment involved both Dare to be Great and Coscott Interplanetary, and those corporations were also indicted. The indictments opened the floodgates. Next to Pounce were the IRS, who, less than three weeks after the announcement of the mail fraud charges, seized and attached what was left of Turner's assets. The FTC, which had sort of flitted around the edges of the picture, but had not yet moved in for the kill, also filed a complaint against Coscott, the sole survivor of Turner's major companies. Glenn W. Turner had one last desperate strategy. Run. In June 1973, he fled to Europe. It's not entirely clear where he was going, but on June 15th, Glenn Turner was arrested while changing planes at the airport in Frankfurt, West Germany. He and two bodyguards traveling with him had $36,000 in cash hidden in their boots at the time of their arrest. The warrant was executed by Interpol, but served by Scotland Yard, the UK police force. Oh, I guess if I, I forgot to mention that Turner was also wanted in various foreign countries, too. For three weeks in the summer of 1973, Glenn Turner was held in Preungesheim Prison in Frankfurt. Three governments, the United States, the UK, and West Germany, were now fighting over who was going to prosecute him and for which crimes. Subsisting in prison on brown bread and sauerkraut, Turner lost 13 pounds in three weeks before he was finally extradited to the United States to stand trial for mail fraud. He told reporters assembled at the Frankfurt airport, I love America even though I'm at war with them. When he was returned to Orlando, Florida, his passport confiscated, Turner learned that Coscott Interplanetary had just filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which was going to kill the possibility of any of the plaintiffs in the class action lawsuit receiving anything substantial. Of claims totaling nearly $50 million, only a measly 240000 trickled back to the court in Pittsburgh. Whatever happened to Glenn Turner, his MLMs, Coscott and Dare to be Great, were already among the costliest frauds in American history. Before we get to the stories of Glenn Turner's trials, first you have to understand what a big deal he was. In 1973, Glenn Turner was one of the most famous men in America. In addition to having barnstormed the country for the past six years selling distributorships in his various schemes, he courted publicity every chance he got, and as flamboyant as unforgettable as he was, the press loved him. As the mail fraud trial neared in the late summer of 1973, everything was in place for media feeding frenzy. There was the famous defendant who was now shouting from the rooftops that the United States government was out to get him, as well as all successful businessmen. It seemed that everybody knew somebody who had been scammed by Coscott or Dare to be Great. So the public was waiting with bated breath to see if Turner would finally be called to account for his scamming. And there was the fate of F. Lee Bailey, America's trial lawyer, who would now go on trial himself for his involvement in a pyramid scheme. Curious that Bailey would turn up 21 years later involved in another, quote, trial of the century. It's almost like he was a glutton for publicity, but of course that can't be true of an upstanding lawyer. This was all happening against the backdrop of the unfolding Watergate scandal, which I covered in another video. The Senate's Watergate hearings, at which sordid revelations came out about President Nixon's secret taping system and the fact that he told his lawyer, John Dean, he was willing to pay a million dollars in hush money to silence the Watergate burglars, all these allegations were televised and riveted the country throughout the summer. Turner's mail fraud trial wouldn't be televised. That kind of reality TV was still 20 years in the future, but it would command plenty of headlines. The trial got underway in Jacksonville, Florida in September 1973. There was a lot of squabbling on the defense side about their lawyers. Ed Garland, a young lawyer from a family of famous Atlanta lawyers, was technically lead counsel but the defense table also included a fellow called Kenneth Michael Robinson, a junior lawyer 
who would later go on to write a book about the case, which was one of the sources for this video. The defense table also included F. Lee Bailey, who had decided to act as his own attorney, a man called Hugh Smith, assistant U.S. attorney from Clearwater, Florida, was the prosecutor. The jury consisted of four men, eight women. Smith and the prosecution made a show of witnesses whom Glenn Turner had fleeced. One of them, a Vietnam veteran who'd lost three limbs, invested $4,500 in Coscott Interplanetary and made $12.40. The Coscott company sent him a letter naming him Disabled Veteran of the Month. A man from Plainfield, Connecticut, produced checks that had been made out to him, void, for zero dollars, signed by Glenn Turner with the note, God bless you. Another man testified that he'd been rolled for $5,000 to join Dare to be Great, without being told that its sole product was a bunch of cassette tapes. This man happened to be deaf, and he testified in sign language. The defense lawyers, including Bailey, badgered and nitpicked at the witnesses to try to destroy their credibility. And they argued endlessly over rules of procedure. At one point, Kenneth Robinson was removed from the courtroom for defying the judge. Bailey was supremely confident that the government's case was weak. He schmoozed with reporters outside the courtroom to encourage good coverage. And he and his wife, a socialite, were often seen dining out at Jackson Bill's finest restaurants. The government's case took four months to present. They called 161 witnesses who generated over 19,000 pages of the trial transcripts. Strategically, it was a mistake. After a few weeks, much less months, the jury was bored, distracted, and checked out. The defense attorneys were never a unified front. Their interests and strategies conflicted with each other. Legally speaking, there was an argument for trying them separately. Garland, the main attorney for Glenn Turner, considered simply resting his case once the government finished. Ken Robinson, however, technically the attorney for Coscott Interplanetary, wanted to put on a defense. He argued passionately that the effort Coscott had put into making cosmetics proved there could have been no intent to defraud investors. This was the classic MLM defense, arguing that there was sufficient window dressing to dilute the basic nature of the business as a pyramid scheme. At the trial, Glenn Turner was out of his element. His lawyers refused to let him testify. Throughout his years of scamming, his best defense had always been his mouth, talking up dreams of riches and success and charming people with his charisma and his enthusiasm. He couldn't do that at the trial. All he could do was sit there and listen to witness after witness testify as to how he had ruined them. Ultimately, what changed the course of the trial was a strategic move. Ben Bunting, Turner's former right-hand man, told the judge that he would be willing to testify in the defense of F. Lee Bailey. But he couldn't do that in front of a jury that would also be deciding his, Bunting's, guilt or innocence. What this meant is that Bailey would have to be dropped from the trial, severed, as they say in legal procedure. The jury couldn't be told why Bailey was being dropped. They might well conclude that the government had decided that their case against him was weak, and maybe that meant it was weak across the board. Gambling on this possibility, as soon as Bailey was dropped, all the defense attorneys suddenly rested their cases, and it went to the jury. To be sure, this did not mean Bailey was innocent. What it meant is that if the government still wanted to try him for crimes they claimed he committed on behalf of Coscott, it would have to be at a new, separate trial. The jury deliberated for six days. None of the lawyers had any idea what was going on in the jury room. On May 30th, 1974, the jury sent a message to the judge, reporting that they were hopelessly deadlocked. The judge was annoyed, but there was nothing he could do but declare a mistrial. The trial had lasted eight months, during which 230 witnesses gave 40,000 pages of testimony. It was believed to have been the most expensive criminal trial in Florida history up until that time, and it ended in a hung jury. Glenn Turner had escaped prison this time, but he wasn't out of the woods yet. The judge scheduled a new trial to begin in two and a half months. This one would be different. The high-priced lawyers were financially exhausted, and they had to get back to working on other cases. Now that he was mostly broke, 
Turner couldn't continue to pay for top-flight legal talent, so it would not be nearly as big a deal for no other reason that no one could afford it. Additionally, Bailey would not be a part of the second trial. The government, deciding that another go at him wasn't worth it, dropped the charges against him when he complained that his right to a speedy trial had been denied. Turner received another reprieve when the second trial was put off until sometime in 1975. So, temporarily reprieved, what did Glenn Turner do? He decided to run for office. Glenn Turner's tilt toward politics seems an almost inevitable twist in the story of his downfall. Audacious to a fault, Turner spun the trial delay as a vindication. In the summer of 1974, with what little money he had left, Turner bought a van, had it painted red, white, and blue, and started rolling through central Florida with a loudspeaker, running for the U.S. Senate on what he called a no-deal platform, presumably meaning no deals with the evil government whom he told everybody was out to get him. At his campaign announcement on June 27th, Turner claimed he was, quote, the first candidate to be indicted before he runs. So, yeah, that campaign tactic would eventually be used again by someone else. It might surprise you to know that Turner was, at least in his public sentiments, a centrist Democrat. He had opposed the Vietnam War, he supported corporate taxes, and he was strongly in favor of racial integration and civil rights. Though he toyed with the idea of running as an independent, the logistics of doing so, particularly in terms of ballot access, made him change his mind. He entered the fray for the Democratic primary for senator from Florida. When the votes were tallied, Turner came in sixth with, with about 51,000 votes, just short of 6.5%. The nomination went to Richard Stone, former Florida Secretary of State, who went on to win the general election. 1974 was a heavily Democratic year, with the Republican brand heavily damaged by the Watergate scandal and Richard Nixon's resignation in August. Turner's bid at politics, though, was largely a distraction. The second trial loomed. Because he couldn't induce a high-profile lawyer to defend him this time, Turner decided to defend himself. Never a good choice for a criminal defendant who isn't already a lawyer. This time around, the government tried to streamline its case. No more exhaustive parade of witnesses to testify to every detail of the operations of Coscott and Dare to be Great. Indeed, the prosecutors were kind of hoping that Turner might go for some sort of deal, and there were negotiations going on for that behind the scenes. But no deal was reached, at least at first, and in early August 1975, the second trial got going, this time in Tampa. The heart of the government's case this time was intent that by running a pyramid scheme with a mathematical impossibility of anyone but a few big fish at the top making money, Glenn Turner knew or should have known that his businesses were inherently fraudulent. It wasn't a bad case, but it was hard to make it clear to the jury through witness testimony. And Turner, acting as his own lawyer, turned on his charisma and charm to shut down witness after witness. He wasn't any good as a lawyer, but he was very good as a folksy and endearing character, whom you just couldn't believe was so craven as to cheat 75,000 people out of nearly $50 million. Six weeks into the trial, the government was still only halfway through its case. A lawyer from the Justice Department floated a new deal. Turner could plead no contest to a charge of selling unregistered securities, which was a felony. However, the charge could be reduced by a judge to a misdemeanor if it was clear that the defendant didn't know they were selling unregistered securities. It was a pretty extraordinary deal that mostly let Turner off the hook, but by this time, mid-September 1975, the government was pretty sure that this second trial would end like the first one did, in a hung jury or even an outright acquittal of Turner. Glenn Turner signed the deal. He would not go to prison. He was broke, dare to be great, exclamation point, had been shut down, Coscott was in bankruptcy, and most of his friends and business associates had deserted him. But he would stay out of prison, at least for the time being. Less than a week after the end of the second trial, Turner hosted a seminar in the circular living room of his giant boathouse on the lake. The session was called 
Welcome to Our World, and it was basically one of the adventure Roman numeral courses without the sales pitch. Turner got up and expounded once again his Napoleon Hill-inspired philosophy of self-help and you too can be rich. Some of the jurors from his second trial were in the audience. At the seminar, Turner said, quote, Any hair lip in America who can be $2 million in debt, that's quite an accomplishment. End quote. In November 1975, two months after Glenn Turner's second trial was short-circuited by the plea deal, the Federal Trade Commission released its decision in Ray Coscott Interplanetary. Legally, this was an important case, but as a practical matter, it was like closing the barn doors long after the horses had escaped. The SEC, the IRS, state's attorneys general, and government prosecutors had pretty much picked Turner's carcass clean of flesh by this time. So a decision that Coscott and Dare to be Great were illegal pyramid schemes was almost superfluous at this point. The decision, however, set the legal precedent, at least on the federal level, for what an illegal pyramid scheme was. The decision established what came to be known as the Coscott Test, which goes like this. First, participants must pay money to the MLM company in return for the right to sell a product. And two, participants must pay money to the company in return for the right to receive rewards that are unrelated to the sale of product to ultimate users in exchange for recruiting other participants into the program. If these two prongs are satisfied, the MLM in question is an illegal pyramid scheme. The Coscott decision of 1975 was an important legal stepping stone that the FTC intended to use to terminate its next target, Amway, the largest MLM in America. However, as I explained in my video on the Amway tools cult, by 1975, Nixon had been replaced as U.S. President by Gerald Ford, former Michigan congressman, whose home district included Ada, Michigan, the home base of Amway. Ford seems to have been personal friends with Amway founders Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel. While we don't know if some sort of political deal was made when DeVos and Van Andel met with Ford in the Oval Office in 1975, it does appear that the multi-level marketing industry successfully co-opted Washington. The FTC case against Amway culminated in a decision in 1979, where measuring Amway against the Coscott test from the 1975 decision, surprisingly, the FTC found that Amway did not quite satisfy it. In other words, it was a legal pyramid scheme. While this decision allowed Amway to continue operating, thus avoiding the sudden death fate of Dare to be Great and the slow bleed-out death of Coscott, the 1979 decision represented more of a truce between the federal government and the MLM industry rather than an outright victory for Amway. Amway next had to turn its attention to the problem festering in its own camp, which was the mafia-like cartel of distributors of motivational tapes and seminars, the tools cult, that threatens to violate the terms set down by the FTC in the 1979 decision. How that battle played out is detailed in my other video, so go check it out. But whenever multi-level marketing defenders have claimed for the last 50 years, oh, this company isn't a pyramid scheme, pyramid schemes are illegal, what they have in mind when they say this, what they consider an illegal pyramid scheme, is Coscott Interplanetary. Curiously, in the 1975 decision, the FTC chastised itself for moving too slowly to stop the abuses of Coscott and Dare to be Great against distributors and consumers. Responsible authorities, it said, including this commission, have acted far too slowly to protect consumers from the manipulations of Turner and others like him. The record also reveals a staggering human toll. Money borrowed, jobs quit, homes mortgaged, and even personal bankruptcy for some who dared to be great." End quote. Though it had been sold in bankruptcy to a new owner, a man called Max Morris, Coscott continued to operate for several years following Turner's downfall in 1975. He had nothing to do with the company at this point, and Coscott was severely hampered by IRS and court liens on all of its future earnings. 
but it did continue to sell cosmetics, mostly door-to-door, through the remainder of the 1970s. Coscott wound up in court again in 1979, when its corporate warehouse was foreclosed for tax liens. Though not very active after that, it did technically continue to exist. The Florida Secretary of State's office finally dissolved the corporation in 1992, after it failed to file an annual report. In the late 1970s, it seemed like Turner was down pretty much for good. He made two more attempts at elected office, running for Florida state legislature seats in 1976 and 78, but he made little headway. He continued to live in the boathouse of his unfinished castle by the lake. He and his wife Alice divorced. He later married a third time. But when it came to business, Turner was a one-trick pony. He was mostly broke, and he knew of only one way to make money. Pyramid schemes. In April 1979, four men formed a corporation called Challenge Inc. All had been formerly employed by Glenn Turner. One of the four was Edward Rector, who had once been Turner's bodyguard. Now, I couldn't confirm that Rector was one of the men who had been arrested with Turner at the Frankfurt airport in 1973 with $36,000 in their shoes. I think he was, but I can't absolutely confirm it. Rector owned all the stock of Challenge, Inc., and he was chairman of the board of directors. Guess what Challenge, Inc.'s business was? Motivational courses. And recruiting distributors to sell motivational courses. Guess what the specific course was that Challenge, Inc. had been formed to sell? The Adventure Series, the very same one that had been developed in 1969 for Dare to be Great! Exclamation point. The briefcases full of motivational cassette tapes were back. Glenn Turner was not officially in the ownership structure or employed by Challenge, Inc., but he was listed as a consultant, and he had given the company permission to sell his old adventure courses. Very little was new about Challenge, Inc. The Go meetings had been renamed Shooting Star Seminars. Even the buy-in price was the same, $5,000. Incredibly, After being killed dead by the SEC and staked through the heart after death by the FTC decision, Dare to be Great was rising from the grave like a zombie. Turner was trying the same shtick again. The only difference was a cosmetic one, no pun intended. Challenge's rules did not technically require that someone become a distributor in order to buy the adventure course. This meant that technically, the courses could theoretically be sold at retail to outside customers. That's the window dressing of retail sales required by the 1979 Amway decision. However, as a practical matter, the courses were unmarketable to anyone who wasn't a distributor. And promoters sold distributorships by hyping how much money prospects could make by recruiting others to become distributors. It was, in other words, a classic pyramid scheme. By August 1980, Challenge Inc. had sold 4,980 adventure courses on cassette tapes. Less than 50 were sold to people who weren't distributors. It's not entirely clear how the money from Challenge flowed to Turner, but he was undoubtedly involved. And Challenge recruiters frequently invoked his name during their sales pitches. The whole cycle began again. Complaints flooded into state consumer protection offices. Turner and Associates moved money around through various corporations in other states, including Florida and Oklahoma. But Arizona was particularly tenacious in fighting him. A court in that state indicted Turner for fraud. In March 1985, Glenn Turner surrendered himself to Arizona state authorities. There was yet another trial in Phoenix, much less showy than Turner's previous trials. A jury acquitted him of some charges, but found him and several other associates, including Ed Rector, guilty on nine counts of fraud, conspiracy, and running an illegal pyramid scheme. In August 1987, almost exactly 20 years to the day after the incorporation of Coscott Interplanetary, an Arizona judge sentenced Turner to seven years. Turner's fast talk and easy charisma couldn't get him out of this one. He was finally going to prison. Turner seems to have been a model prisoner. After a lifetime of boasting of being a high school dropout, sometimes a middle school dropout, he finally earned his GED from behind bars. While in prison, Turner wrote copious amounts of letters, essays, and poetry, much of it motivational or reflecting on what happened to him. Here's one of his poems, dated 1991. 
I've seen a different world most have never seen. A world of tears and fears, where there's very little to cheer, lonely nights and sad days. Where most relearn to pray, cries from the young, fright from the old, where only the strong, and sometimes the smart, are left to be from evil men's deeds." End quote. In February 1992, Glenn W. Turner was paroled. He eventually went to live in North Carolina. His third marriage did not survive much beyond the end of his prison term, and he was divorced a second time. The unfinished castle by the lake outside of Orlando had been destroyed by fire in 1988 while he was in jail. The boathouse remained, but Glenn Turner no longer lived there. At long last, his days as a pyramid schemer were finally over. After his release from prison, Glenn W. Turner never scammed again, or at least not so far as we know. But his long legacy of motivational and self-help talk long outlived the pyramid schemes that made him famous. He still has supporters today, quite devoted ones. I found, for example, a blog on Medium from 2016 from a man who met Turner several times and considered him a friend and sort of mentor. I'll put a link in the description to it. There you can see a photo of Glenn Turner from late in his life, his bushy toupee even more outrageous than ever. As I said at the beginning of this video, when Glenn Turner died in January 2020, just before the pandemic, his death went almost unnoticed. In February 2023, a year before this video was made, Washington Post reporter Helene Olin wrote a column essentially eulogizing Turner as the man who introduced the concept of fake it till you make it, not just into the multi-level marketing business, but into American culture in general. Fake It Till You Make It was the title of an expose of Amway from the early 1980s, one of the early books to shed light on the abuses of the MLM industry and especially the cult-like motivational organizations surrounding Amway. Turner's influence is arguably pretty broad. Here's what happened to a few other characters in the story of Coscott Interplanetary. William Penn Patrick, founder of Holiday Magic and the inspiration for Turner and Coscott, continued to run his own pyramid schemes until the end of his life. Undaunted after his failure to stop Ronald Reagan from getting the Republican nomination for California governor in 1966, Patrick later tried to run for the U.S. Senate, but didn't get very far. In June 1973, Patrick was piloting his restored P-51 Mustang, a World War II-era fighter plane, over his farm at Clear Lake Oaks, California. Patrick didn't have much experience flying this plane, and after one pass, his plane stalled and went into a spin. The crash killed him and a holiday magic distributor from Finland. He was only 43. The year after his death, 1974, Holiday Magic was shut down by the FTC and the courts. By one estimate, it had built $250 million out of its victims. Glenn Turner never stole quite that much. Had Patrick not died in that plane crash, he almost certainly would have gone to prison. As for the other major participants in Coscott, I couldn't find much on their later lives. Jerry Jacobus, once known as Lady Coscott, was still in the cosmetics business, though a company under her own name, in the mid-1980s. Terrell Jones, known as The Professor, reportedly went into the self-help business in the later 1970s, marketing courses based on Werner Erhard's Est, itself a cult with significant similarities to those connected with Holiday Magic and William Penn Patrick. Hobart Wilder, the second CEO of Coscott and Holiday Magic, went into the real estate business, he died in 2009 in Longwood, Florida. Epcot Center, now known just as Epcot, which had inspired Glenn Turner with its space-age aesthetics, finally opened its doors in Bay Lake, Florida in October 1982. The centerpiece of the park was Spaceship Earth, a globe that followed the designs of futurist Buckminster Fuller. Though a success, Epcot has struggled to keep its futuristic cutting-edge image as technology and the culture have changed markedly since the bold days of 1960s futurism. Ironically, Epcot now seems a bit retro. Coscott never achieved its goal of having an office in the Epcot compound. F. Lee Bailey, the lawyer and Turner's fixer for a time, was never retried for those charges relating to his involvement in Coscott and Dare to be Great. 
1975, he defended high-profile terrorist Patty Hearst, who was kidnapped and brainwashed by a bizarre group known as the Symbionese Liberation Army. Bailey was possibly drunk when he gave his summation to the jury in that case. Hearst went to prison, but she was eventually pardoned by President Bill Clinton. Bailey went on to join O.J. Simpson's defense team for his double murder trial in 1994. Bailey's high-profile law practice continued on after that, but in 2001 he was disbarred after a controversy involving the acceptance of stock in a pharmaceutical company as payment for his legal fees in defending a drug dealer. Bailey fought to get his law license back for more than a decade, but ultimately failed. In June 2021, he died, age 87. Since Turner's downfall in the 1970s, the sector of the American economy that has been infiltrated by multi-level marketing companies has grown enormously. Amway was for many years the biggest and most far-reaching, and among the most controversial. Amway has largely protected its interests politically by cultivating relationships with both political parties, though the Republican Party, and particularly the religious right, have a much stronger institutional relationship with Amway than the Democratic Party does. Betsy DeVos, a daughter-in-law of Amway founder Rich DeVos, served as President Trump's Secretary of Education. Trump himself was in the MLM business for a time. The immense reach of the multi-level marketing industry into the American economy and political sphere is well documented. In, among other books, Robert Fitzpatrick's book Ponzi-nomics, which was one of the sources that I used for this video. In the 21st century, new MLM schemes are popping up everywhere, most selling cosmetics, lotions, nutritional supplements, or motivation. Will the antiquated legal machinery that allows the MLM industry to operate, a legal regime of which Coscott Interplanetary was a significant part, will that change in the future? Well, time will tell. But what is clear is that Glenn Turner was and will always remain a key figure in the history of multi-level marketing scams and the history of economic deception in America generally in the last half of the 20th century. The pyramid schemes of today could not be what they are without Glenn Turner having come first with his homespun charm, his grandiose promises, and his insistence that you too could be rich like him if you only just believed in yourself. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it, recommend it to your friends, do all the stuff that you normally do for a video you like. I'm coming up on 100,000 subscribers, so right now subscribing to the channel would be especially appreciated if you aren't already. The sources I used to make this video are listed in the credits at the end, and they're also in the description. Although I did use an AI assist on some of the visuals, the cartoons, for example, no part of the research or writing of this video was done with AI. Special thanks to Roberta Blevins of the Life After MLM podcast. Remember, I'm a guest on an upcoming episode about this subject, so be sure to check that out. I also have some books on Amazon, most of them fiction, including two crime thrillers, In Deadly Mirrors and The Sun Thief. I'll have a new book called Daniel Vanished, A Mystery, coming out soon, available on Amazon Kindle. Thank you to all my fans and supporters, and thank you once again for joining me on another journey into the past.